In his confession, Hansen described how he would take his victims into the woods and hunt them as prey. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're looking at 10 horrific crimes more people should know about. Take them up one by one to the basement, hit them on the back of the head, and uh, dissolve the bodies in acid. For this list, we'll be considering the most shocking and notorious crimes that you've probably never heard of. Which of these cases are you familiar with? Let us know in the comments. The Death of Sylvia Likens The trial they called this case the single worst crime perpetuated against an individual in Indiana's history. Sylvia and Jenny Likens were born to two carnival workers who regularly traveled around the country. During one of their parents' trips in 1965, the girls were left in the care of Gertrude Beneshevsky, who agreed to house them for a weekly $20 payment. When this money began coming in late, Beneshevsky took out her anger on the Likens girls. Eventually, she directed the extreme abuse almost entirely at Sylvia, sometimes to the point of starvation. Gertrude made her a prisoner. Gertrude encouraged others to physically abuse her, to emotionally abuse her, and she abused her. Sylvia's maltreatment came not only from Banaszewski, but also from her children and other neighborhood kids, culminating in Sylvia's tragic death on October 26, 1965. Banaszewski served less than 20 years in prison, while the others arrested for the crime were handed much shorter sentences. And to know that you're responsible for taking someone's life is real hard to live with. Banaszewski died five years later. The Crimes of Jerry Brutus Born in Webster, South Dakota in 1939, Jerry Brutus developed a fetish for women's shoes at a very young age. As he grew older, this obsession manifested in the form of attacking women only to steal their shoes and keep them for himself. Jerry Brutus was married. There was nothing really that made him stand out. But yet behind closed doors, he was into a variety of fetishes, um, and yet nobody would ever know because he was doing it within the privacy of his own home. When the bodies of Linda Saley and Karen Sprinker, two young Oregon women, were discovered in the Long Tom River in 1969, police were quick to identify similarities in their deaths. They questioned students at the nearby Oregon State University and were led to Brutus, who later confessed to the murders in gory detail. Jerry took pictures of his victims in, in, in select clothing. Brutus opted for a guilty plea and was sentenced to three consecutive life terms. He died of liver cancer in 2006 while incarcerated. Dennis Rader, the BTK Killer In February 2005, Dennis Rader, a family man and local church leader in Wichita, Kansas, was arrested and charged with the murders of 10 people. He was married. He was relatively young. He was 28 years old, relatively handsome. So he should have everything going for him. Between 1974 and 1991, Rader had stalked most of his victims to their homes, where they were bound, tortured, and then killed. He derived his own nickname, the BTK Killer, from this method. Raider stopped his spree after 1991, only to begin sending taunting letters to police and media houses a little over a decade later. TK sent a letter to the office claiming responsibility for killing Vicki Weggerly in 1986. He enclosed a copy of her driver's license. He may have gotten away with the crimes, if not for a floppy disk he sent to the police which was traced back to him. Police were able to find metadata from a deleted document that contained the name of his church and the first name, Dennis. Raider pleaded guilty to the killings and was sentenced to 10 consecutive life terms. John Hagg's Life of Crimes Dubbed the Acid Bath Murderer, John George Hagg was a British serial killer who was active between 1944 and 1949. Hag began his life of crime selling fraudulent stocks under a false identity. Almost as soon as he left school, he began the life of a petty crook and swindler. He was eventually caught and served multiple prison terms for his scams. After leaving prison in 1943, Hag started targeting wealthy individuals and killing them for their money. He would then dissolve the bodies in sulfuric acid, believing it would leave no trace of the crime. This is what we come now to see as, as the quintessential image of the acid bath killer in practice. Haig claimed five lives in this manner without getting caught, but his sixth victim would prove to be his downfall. At his trial, Haig pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity, but regardless, he was convicted and executed by hanging. 
Nobody was fooled by these claims of drinking blood and forests of crucifixes and things like that. It had clearly been a ploy. The disappearance of the Sauter children. George and Jenny Sauter, alongside nine of their 10 children, were asleep on Christmas Eve, 1945, when their Fayetteville, West Virginia house caught fire. The couple managed to escape with four of the children, but all attempts to rescue the other five trapped upstairs proved futile. And the five of them shared two bedrooms between them, both rooms upstairs. The family initially believed all five children died in the fire, only to find no remains of them in the rubble. Authorities scavenged the ashes of the fire looking for the remains of the five missing Sauter children, but nothing was found, and they were presumed dead due to the fire. Despite multiple theories and investigations at the state and federal levels, the case turned up no new leads and eventually grew cold. Soon after the fire, George and Jenny began to suspect their children were not dead, but instead kidnapped believing the fire was deliberately set as a diversion. For decades, the Sauter family kept up a billboard at the site offering a $5,000 reward for any information about the disappearance. It was, however, taken down after Jenny's death in 1989. The Cleveland Torso Murders. It's one of the darkest chapters in Cleveland history. Tom was uh, in, in fear. And during that time, a serial killer stalked this city. In the 1930s, a serial killer reigned terror in Cleveland, Ohio, murdering and dismembering at least 12 people in the span of four years. The remains of these individuals were found scattered around the city, with most of them having died from decapitation. Of the 12 known victims, only two were positively identified as Edward Andresi and Florence Polillo. But all of the victims had one thing in common. People who would not be missed, people who had no identity. A third victim was thought to be a woman named Rose Wallace, but her identity was never confirmed. The investigation into the murders, which was the largest in Cleveland history, turned up two suspects, but no charges stuck. I'm 99% sure we pegged him and the belief that this face, this man, is Cleveland's torso killer. Francis Edward Sweeney, nothing points away from him. Today, the identity of the torso murderer remains unknown. The Hunts of Robert Hansen. Growing up in Iowa, Robert Hansen was a shy loner who spent his free time hunting. After serving multiple jail sentences for petty theft, he moved to Anchorage, Alaska, where he settled with his family. And opened a bakery. It was a huge success. He had a wife and children, and except for his stutter, he fit in completely. While there, Hansen began abducting young women to his home at gunpoint and assaulting them. With his private plane, he flew some of these women out into the wild, where he hunted them like prey before taking their lives. His habit was to toy with his prey before he made the kill. In total, Hansen killed at least 17 women. With the help of one of his victims who escaped, police were able to nail Hansen in 1983 and succeeded in sending him to prison. Robert Hansen was convicted of murdering four women and sentenced to 461 years plus life with no chance of parole. He died in 2014 of natural causes. The murder of John Price. In 2001, Catherine Knight became the first woman in Australian history to be sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. But what was most surprising was when you did see her, just how terribly ordinary she looked. She could have been a librarian. Her crime was the gruesome murder of her romantic partner, John Price. Price had kicked Knight out of his house after years of living together, during which she was reportedly violent towards him. His children say that there were scars on his body from where she'd stabbed him and hit him. On the night of February 29th, 2000, Knight returned to Price's house and stabbed him repeatedly before doing and planning far more heinous actions. I just couldn't believe that one human being, either male or female, of our species could carry out uh, such a calculated um, offense. Police, responding to a call from Price's neighbor and co-worker, found Knight comatose in the house and placed her under arrest. The Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum Heist Around 1.24 a.m. on March 18, 1990, guards at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston, Massachusetts buzzed in two men who appeared to be police officers. Once inside, the men subdued the guards and set about on what would become one of the largest museum heists in history. They handcuffed them and they wrapped duct tape around their eyes and they uh, locked them up in the basement. Over the next hour, the robbers stole 13 works of art worth over half a billion dollars, 
leaving empty frames hanging in their place. The FBI jumped on the case immediately, but their investigation stalled due to a lack of physical evidence at the crime scene. Those thieves were careful to cover their tracks. They went back to the security area and made sure they grabbed the video surveillance tape. The heist remains unsolved to this day, but one popular theory is that it was orchestrated by the Boston Mafia. As federal investigators listened to their informants and wiretaps, they heard Merlino talk about trying to return two of the stolen pieces. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. The Disappearance of Dorothy Jane Scott Dorothy Jane Scott was a 32-year-old single mother who was working as a retail store secretary in California when she disappeared in 1980. Dorothy was gonna go get the car and bring it around. Before she got to the car, there was somebody there already waiting for her. In the months leading up to the incident, Scott had received multiple calls from an anonymous man who claimed to love her, but also threatened her life. What was your reaction when you were told the specifics of what the caller said? That just almost put the final nail in the coffin. Those threats were ostensibly made manifest on May 28th when Scott was abducted in her own car after driving a co-worker to the hospital. Her car was later abandoned and set on fire in an alley where it was found the next day. The car being set on fire, it's like, wow. Scott, however, remained missing until four years later when her burnt remains were discovered by a construction worker. 